Welcome to Celtic State of Mind. My name is Paul John Dykes, and tonight I'm delighted to be joined by Alex Horsburgh. Alex, welcome to Celtic State of Mind. Great, Paul. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> We've not been awarded the league title, and we won't be able to play the Scottish Cup semi final. What's your thoughts? on where we are with that at the moment. I know some of the other countries are making decisions across Europe. Well, I said it on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, Paul, and I don't mind putting it out there. Uh, just call it. Give Celtic the title. I think there's too much humming and hawing, as we say in Scotland. I, I'm a wee bit miffed by the 14-14-14 the setup that uh, prevents teams from being relegated. It also blocks out Kelty Hearts and Brewer Rangers coming up from the pyramid. And, um, you know... I've been a football fan for 50 years, Paul, and uh, obviously, strange times, there's that cliche again, but uh, I just say, for goodness sake, call it, and get it out of the way. I don't think we should abandon the season. I don't. I think they've abandoned the season in France. Um, it would be nice if we could play out the games that are remaining behind closed doors, but, you know, any sensible person, any sensible neutral, and I am a neutral, would say... You know, I don't think Celtic were going to be caught. So, so call it. You know, for, for goodness sake, call it. Um, either avoid it or call it, but do something for goodness sake. Because, um, you know, I, I put up on Twitter today, as a football fan of 50 years, this is the first time I've been a wee bit bored with Scottish football. And it's not because of the lockdown. It's because they just won't call it. I think it's the 26th of May they have to call it. Mm-hmm. I think they have to call it by the 26th of May. So, you know, um, you know, best foot forward and call it. And for me, it's Celtic style. If it was, you know, Rangers in Celtic's position at the moment, I'd still be calling for the uh, you know the, the the title to be to be called, um, th- this is where I start to get a wee bit. This is where I, I back off from it now because you know over fifty years of watching Scottish football, I've heard a lot of conspiracy theories, and there's also you know the, the second the first sport in Scotland is football, and the second sport is conspiracy theories about football, and I've really got to the stage now where when I see you know coercion, conspiracy, bullying. Um, I'm just, you know, I just, you know, the thing that I scream now is call it, for goodness sake, call it, call the title and say, you know, it's Celtic's title or if it was Rangers in the same position, it's Rangers title, call it for goodness sake and let's finish this season because I don't think we can really, I don't, my own personal opinion is I think this lockdown, this situation with COVID-19 will go on until probably July or August. I don't think we'll get these outstanding games played. So I think we have to call it. The soap opera for me, uh, I'm not as prolific as you on Twitter, but I'm on it maybe more than I was this time last year. And I just kind of despair at all the, the, uh, you know, all the chat back and forward about, um, you know, Rangers said this, Celtic said this, claim, counter claim. Um, I just want to see this season decided. I, I even saw uh, one former player saying, don't call Celtic champions, call them winners. Don't mm-hmm. don't name them champions, name them winners. And again, that you know, only in Scotland. Um, just as a neutral, I just I just want to see this season finished. And I think they should call it. I think they should have the guts to call it. And in fact, I think they should have had the guts to call all four divisions. Yeah, before now, and the the thing that you're you're mentioning there in relation to calling the title, I had a very interesting discussion, Alex, with David Lowe probably four or five weeks ago now, the financial advisor of Fergus McCann when Fergus took over Celtic back in 1994. And, you know, David was looking at the ramifications of where we are in relation to the the finances of Scottish football, which, you know, at the best of times, Alex, can be fairly precarious. I mean, you look over the last 15 years, for example, the amount of clubs who have faced financial ruin, gone into administration, etc. And I think, the one thing that um, people are overlooking is the fact that, yeah, we, we do have to get the title argument resolved, but the clubs that are really going to be looking down the barrel of a gun right now, I think will be far more than people realise. There are going to be clubs that, that really do live you know, week to week, month to month, Alex, and if we've got three or four months of no income through the gate and uh, all the average revenue that every fan actually spends when they're at a game, there's going to be a lot of clubs who will be facing financial peril. Do you think when we get back, when we get back to playing football, we will have a full complement of, of sides? Well, in a funny sort of way, I think we will. Because um, I think the way Scottish football is set up, you know, I mean, obviously there was the Charlie Nicholas comment about the smaller clubs have too big a say and all the rest of it. But 
I think these clubs are already are already finding a way to survive, and a lot of them, a lot of the smaller clubs, are getting very creative on social media. I've seen Cowden Beef uh, getting very creative. Uh, Berwick Rangers, uh, I know they're low in league now, but Berwick Rangers have got uh, the commentator Derek Ray involved mm. um, as an ambassador for their club, and I think. If we can get to maybe July and get things back to semi-normality in life in July, I think these clubs will survive. But I think, as I said to you in a, in a, in a, a tweet recently, Paul, um, I'm, not, I'm not in favour of culling clubs. Um, a lot of people have this mindset of, uh, you know, oh, Scotland's do we for 42 league clubs. Well, Scottish football is as much about the football community at a smaller level as it is between Celtic, as it is. Celtic and Rangers. I mean, I made a joke, a flip joke on Twitter. I said maybe the best league lined up would be a, a top league of two with them both playing each other forever. And I was talking about Celtic and Rangers there. But, uh, you know, that was just a wee kind of, kind of flip comment. But I think, I think these smaller clubs are a lot more savvy now, uh, especially on social media. And I think we'll just about make it. I think we'll get them back. And of course, yeah. in a funny sort of way, they have uh, voted for self-preservation with this uh, three leagues of 14. You know, the, the comment I made, I was going to bring that up because it, it does spark off a very interesting debate, Alex, and I'm all for that. Um, a friend of mine, I think I might have mentioned this to you before, but a, a good friend of mine's a season ticket holder at uh, Central Park. And I've, I've been to Central Park on a number of occasions in a previous life, in a previous job, not because I supported Cowden Beath or anybody else in Fife, but I've been in the stadium a hell of a lot. And I realise what it takes to function as a club, you know, the size of Cowden Beath and with the attendances that a club like Cowden Beath get. Um, I was all, also given a really quite concerning insight into the running of Dunfermline Athletic when they were in administration back in 2012. And I realised at that time, you know, in Fife, a fairly small area, um, there's four senior clubs, four stadiums, you know, four different businesses all relying on, on a, a much smaller population. And I, I think the the tweet that, that got quite a few comments, uh, particularly from kind of smaller clubs, fans of what you would call provincial clubs, the comment was, you know, should clubs consider either merging, ground sharing? The third one, which I didn't put up, is a business alliance, non-football, Alex, whereby you know they can share the loads in, in terms of you know scouting or training facilities or groundsmen, that kind of thing. Do you think we'll ever get to that stage where clubs realise that we don't need four stadiums in, in Fife and, and perhaps two of the, the clubs should uh, marry up? Well, I, I think clubs can ground share, but... Mm. Um... I don't think mergers are, will ever happen. I mean, I'm old enough to remember George Farm, the ex Dunfermline manager. He he came up with an idea for a Fife United in the early 1970s. The the pernickety nature, the the contrary nature of Scottish football, or the the counter nature, as they would say in Fife, of Scottish football, is that if the if you decided overnight Dunfermline and Cowdenbeath are going to merge, Dunfermline fans would come out in their droves and say, "What are we doing merging with this wee Diddy club?" And Cowden Beath fans would come out. In fact, Cowden Beath fans who haven't been at games for years would come out and say, "Oh no, no, no! We want to, uh, we want to preserve the club for the town because it's one of the few things that keeps us on the map." So this is again, this is the contrary nature of Scottish football. You'd see people coming out of the woodwork that have never had any interest in the team for years, saying, "Oh no, no, no! We want the status quo." And to, to cut a long story short, Paul, I just don't think you'll ever see mergers of football clubs. I think a, a lot of football fans, um, even at the lower level, I think they'd rather see their teams go out of business than merge. You know, Cowdenbeath fans, you know, Cowdenbeath fans, you know, Cowdenbeath and Dunfermline merging, non-starter, East Fife Wraith Rovers, non-starter, Motherwell Airdrie, never going to happen. And, um, well, you saw what happened with uh, Cali and Thistle when, when they tried to get into the, to the Scottish League. I mean, that, uh, that caused a lot of uh, rifts in Inverness before they finally merged. So, yeah, to, to answer your question, I just don't think mergers will, will, will ever happen. I think it, I think it messes with the, the DNA of football. I think the other thing that I, I failed to mention, it's very much the flip of my, my argument, is there was, a, there was a study fairly recently. It was on the SFA's website in relation to the economy that a football club the size of Air United brings to the local community. And that was interesting in itself um, because the figures that they were they were actually listing were astronomical in relation to the size of the club, Alex. So I think uh, economically it may actually not be viable 
uh, for the surrounding businesses and the surrounding areas. But in the back of my mind, I do have some doubts about some of the clubs who are maybe living beyond their means and they may not get through it. But again, that's a profit of doom in me. And that's me looking at reports that football will be played behind closed doors until you know January and, and that type of thing, Alex. But we haven't had any anything confirmed. Now, you're talking about Cowdenbeath. You're a Cowdenbeath fan yourself. Celtic's captain is a Fifer, not not far away from Cowdenbeath, and in actual fact from Hillabeath. And Fife does have a rich kind of tapestry of producing the footballers. When you think about going back to Hillabeath, you, you drive in there, you see... Slim Jim Baxter looking down nonchalantly from his uh, his wee pedestal that he's got there. You've got Johnny Thompson and various others. George Conley from High Valleyfield. Uh, do you still think that the small villages are, are producing footballers like they used to back in the day? Scott Brown might be the last of a very long line, Paul. Um, there's other guys as well. Tommy Hutchison was from Carden Den. Played for Scotland, Coventry, Manchester City. David Speedy was from Glenrothes. Played for Chelsea. Um... I've got a feeling Scott Brown may be the last of a long line. It's a shame, really, because, I mean, interestingly enough, the names I mentioned, I didn't mention the likes of Tommy Hutchison and, and David Speedy, and there'll be plenty of others. Bert Payton, for example, from High Valleyfield. And uh, I've had the pleasure of speaking to Bert. Bert went away down to Leeds United. As you say, it's a long line. And I remember, even when we were younger, 20 years ago, maybe playing football, there was a few guys that came through and played and, and made the grade. John Potter, again, another high Valleyfield boy who's now at Hibs as uh, Jack Ross's assistant. But it, it's unfortunate. Why do you think that is? Because the villages used to you know, produce player after player. Well, I'll tell you a story about high Valleyfield, Paul, because um, you know uh, I used to date a girl from high Valleyfield when I was in my late teens, and I had no concept of the village um, before I spent some time in it. And um, one of the things, I don't know if it's still the case, but back then uh, in the early 80s, there was a lot of people in High Valley Field that had a bit of a West of Scotland accent. I quizzed somebody about this once and they said, well, it's because High Valley Field basically came out of uh, Ayrshire Miners, you know, transplanting themselves to Fife. And of course, Cowdenbeath Football Club were formed by the Pollock family, who were also from Ayrshire, settled in the town and, and, and came to Fife partly for business, partly to work in, in the mines. And you know, maybe there's something in the, the west of Scotland uh, DNA. Maybe uh, I've got a feeling, I don't know for certain, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not on the same level as a Bob Crampsey or, 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 or anything like that, but I've got a feeling that a lot of people migrated from the west of Scotland and kind of brought football to the east in a funny sort of way. And, uh, mm-hmm. and then, of course, you have that other affinity, um, you know, the pilgrimage to Carden Den and John Thompson and well, that's that's my theory anyway. I think when people from the west of Scotland migrated to the east, they maybe brought. I think football was already popular, but I think they they kind of they brought football with them and they brought an attitude with them. And um, maybe maybe that answers your question. I think it's a very good uh, a very good theory because when you go to High Valley Field and it was always a boxing and a football mining village, as many of the mining villages were, Alex. Um, there's so many Maguires that uh, obviously are coming over from Donegal via Hamilton. So you're absolutely right. There, there is a, a kind of West Coast twang to the accent. And that I think that's where it comes from. And perhaps they brought the football and ability and the, and the love for football with them. But uh, going back to George Conley, I, I believe having read an article that you produced during the week, that you've seen the great man in one of your first European Memories. You you watched the game between Celtic and Leeds United, uh, which George became famous for. Yeah, it was actually the, the second leg. I have I have uh, memories. I have uh, I, I saw the I saw the Ellen Road game later on. Um, I kind of got um, familiar with the Ellen Road game later on. But my first football memory, uh, and I've shown my age here, was sitting with my late father in a house in Cowdenbeath on a Wednesday night. I don't know if the game was live or if it was recorded, but it was Celtic versus Leeds. Uh, Celtic won 2-1, of course. 3-1 on aggregate, went through to the European Cup final. As far as I can remember, that is the first football bonding experience I had with my dad. My dad wasn't a huge football fan back then, but I was starting to get interested. The funny thing was, he ended up going to more live games than me um, you know, in, in the 90s before he, before he died at the end of that decade. But um, yeah, Celtic leads 136,000 at Hamden. Um, it was the first time I had any concept of uh, Celtic, the hoops, uh, the crowd, the national stadium. 
And uh, yeah, it's the first game I can remember watching on TV with my dad. And then, of course, it was the World Cup that year as well. Uh, we watched the World Cup together and that was it. I was a football fan. When you look at that kind of period, what an introduction, Alex, you know, to see the green and white hoops as it would have been because it was a colour footage, wasn't it? The, the Hamden game that was on the TV. The one thing I always think about that game, 136,000 European record. And that was at a time when a lot of fans were getting carried over the turnstiles and, uh, you know, people working on the turnstiles were make, maybe making a few quid themselves but no actually recording some of the numbers. So it, it was probably closer to 150,000, which is quite frightening to think, you know? Yeah, it was, inc- it was incredible. I mean, we had a black and white telly. Uh, I did see some of the World Cup that year in colour because the women down the road had a colour TV. And I think it was the I think it was the mixture of the colour TV, the football, the Brazil shirt, um, that West Germany shirt always kind of caught my eye as well with a badge on it and stuff. Um, and that these are the things that developed me into a football fan. And then in 71, I guess that was the first time I became aware of Celtic versus Rangers. Scottish Cup final, the draw at Hamden, the replay. Both games are on TV as far as I can remember. Um, and then, you know, and actually, well, actually that year, 71 as well, we had the Ibrox disaster and a lot of the uh, the people that were killed were actually from Fife. So that, again, cemented my interest in football. But yeah, Celtic Leeds, 1970, Battle of Britain, Celtic 2, uh, Leeds United 1, Billy Bremner putting Leeds up, uh, Leeds 1 up. And then I think it was, well, John Hughes certainly got the winner. Was it Bertie Old that got the equaliser? Bobby Murdoch. Bobby Murdoch, yeah. Uh, that is the first bonding football bonding experience I had with my dad and then by 71 we were going game, we were going to games together and I was getting lifted over the touchdowns <laughs> albeit a cow and beef them firming in Wraith Rovers mm-hmm. because we used to uh, we used to alternate between the three but we ended up going to cow and beef mostly because we were both from cow and beef. An interesting thing as well you're watching George Conley playing uh, an integral part actually in that victory over Leeds over the two legs you know four years later he was in the the uh, qualification squad for Scotland who finally qualified for the 1974 World Cup finals and would have gone had he not broken his ankle. Meanwhile, Alex, his brother Joe, also of High Valleyfield, played with Cowden Beath. Now, that might have been a wee bit too early for you to have seen him in action, but there is a there is a game where Celtic went to, it was for the opening of, or the unveiling rather, of the floodlights at Central Park, Celtic versus Cowden Beath at Central Park. George Conley was playing centre half. Joe Conley was playing centre forward for Cowden Beath. And I suppose it goes back to our point before about the great talents that were coming out of uh, the small villages around about that time. You mentioned West Germany, and George was often compared to the great Franz Beckenbauer. Just how good was Big George? Oh, yeah, fantastic. And um, of course, I mean, a curial talent, and one of these guys, almost kind of George Best like, he kind of. You know, he kind of left the game too uh, too early. Um, certainly remember the goal at Leeds um, because, uh, you know, um, I found out about the game probably a couple of years later after the Hamden game. But um, I know for a fact that the English press had written Celtic off. Um, Leeds United had rested players before they took on Celtic that night at Ellen Road. Um, there is a story, you'll probably know this better than me, Paul, Something about Don Reavy giving Celtic orange socks to try and kind of throw them off their game, and um, you know he, Celtic had to had to change their socks that night. Referee made them change their socks. Uh, Don Reavy thought it was a good idea to give them orange socks, but there you go, forty five seconds on the clock, bang! Uh, George Conley passed Gary Sprake, and uh, and the whole the whole of the English press really, uh, you know, they kind of had their lips buttoned that night, you know. That is that that's gone down in folklore. You had the the jock Steen Don Revy, and, and by all accounts, Steen and Revy uh, were were quite friendly. But uh, when they went down, it was the old uh, mind game straight away, where the referee realizes that there's a clash of socks. Both teams wearing white socks. So Leeds, with Celtic not taking a change kit, Leeds offered them their two change colours. One was blue, and one was was dark orange. So Steen took the orange ones and said that they would shine like gold under the floodlights. You, you know, he always had he always had a snippet or a soundbite, Jock Steen, didn't he? And um, it certainly did, it did Celtic no harm whatsoever to wear the orange socks. It looked green, white, and orange, so that was fine. Yeah, it, it did. It did look. Yeah, it did look green, green, white, and uh, green, white, and gold, if you like. And uh, another uh, here's another random fact for you: Don Reavy married a woman from Loch Gelly. 
So, so there, there's a there's another random Fife fact for you there. I did not know that he married into Fife stock. Alex, there you go. We're learning all the time. Logelly, <laughs> brilliant. I used to travel in the Logelly Celtic Supporters Club bus, and um, it was it's now called the Arthur McKenna CSC. And Arthur McKenna, being one of the old boys that, that travelled through him, was uh, obviously a prominent member of the club. And I remember reading a book. It was uh, Richard Jobson has been interviewed, Alex. And he spoke about going through on the Logelli CSC. He used to sit next to Arthur McKenna. You know, by the time I start going to the games, they're called the Arthur McKenna CSC. It's brilliant just passing that bat on down from generation to generation. Another thing, while we're on the subject of Fife, and I've mentioned Richard Jobson, we've had a fair few decent bands coming out of the villages as well, haven't we? Yeah, well, actually, the funny thing was uh, a guy, uh, a guy called Michael. I think it's Michael Mlotkiewicz at Dunfermline. Yeah. He he tweeted me an article I did about thirty years ago about five bands in a in a magazine called The Cut, which was like a Scottish music magazine. They were trying to make it the, the Scottish NME, and um, obviously Skids Big Country were mentioned. Uh, Rosillos, Fay Fife from Oakley. There was uh, and and more mainstream. There was people like Barbara Dixon. Yeah, and um, um, I think Ian Anderson from Jeff Hotel ended up in Fife as well. I don't know if he was a Fifer, but he certainly ended up living there. Did Nazareth get a mention in your feature as well? Yeah, how could I forget? Nazareth, uh, Dan McCafferty, Pete Agnew. Actually, before I got into radio, I used to do uh, mobile discos and residencies, and I actually used to do the Cross Ford. I used to do the Pitfern Arms and Cross Ford. That was my wee residency when I was in my early 20s. And uh, Pete Agnew and uh, Dan McCafferty used to come in for a wee drink because they lived in Cross Ford. And uh, Nazareth's still uh, huge. In fact, uh, they had a song out a couple of years ago. Um, obviously, Dan McCafferty not with the band now, but um, uh, Pete Agnew's uh, still very much you know, leading the line with Nazareth. I can't remember the name of the lead singer they've got now, but they had a song out a couple of years ago, Tattooed on My Brain, which was just an unbelievable... I mean, it was up there with Broken Down Angel and uh, My White Bicycle and all the rest of them. Um, what an incredible... Uh, Incredible staying power. And I know Dan McCaffrey's got a solo album out just now as well. So, yeah, how can we forget Nazareth? A couple of interesting things here. Mikey, who you mentioned, Mikey Mikovic, who used to work in, at Dunfermline as a general manager. I think Mikey probably was the youngest general manager in Scottish football at that time because he was maybe in his late 20s, early 30s. And he's a very forward-thinking young man. And, you know, when he when he comes out with concepts, etc., they're always worth listening to. And it's a shame he's no longer involved in football, unfortunately, Alex. I was just going to say, Paul, again, this is this is all of this sounds a bit uh, like nepotism. Uh, but actually, uh, Michael's grandfather was my first boss because when I left school in the late 70s, I went to work at Halbeef Technical College in Dunfermline. And uh, I was working with the Jannies. I was working with the janitors, £17.50 a week on work experience. And that was my first job, six months work experience. And uh, Mikey's grandfather was uh, the, I think he was the head janitor. There was three of them. And he was the, he was the head janitor at Halbeef Technical College in Dunfermline. So uh, so there you are. There's another random connection for you. Mikey used to design, he had a big say in things like the design of the kits and all that kind of stuff. So he went right back to the old, you know, a retrospective nod back to the 60s with the candy stripes for the pars and all that. And he, he redone the badge to make it look more kind of traditional. So Mikey done a lot of good work up there, I've got to say. But you mentioned uh, Nazareth. One thing about Dan McCafferty, he was a big influence on Axel Rose from Guns N' Roses. I mean, that's been mentioned as fact. You know, he played a big influence in Axel Rose. So, you know, some people may think Nazareth, you know, weren't a big band, but they, I mean, they used to tour with the Rolling Stones. There used to be a great pub in Dunfermline, Alex, with the old tour posters and all that were on the walls, you know. And it was the Rolling Stones with Nazareth supporting them. It was quite incredible. Hopefully, there's a, a few other bands bubbling away just now that that might come to fruition from Dunfermline. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I mean, the, the whole Dunfermline music scene, I was very lucky to catch it late 70s, early 80s when I first left school. And they had the Kinema Ballroom, of course. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's almost incredible to think now, but, you know, 40 years ago, I can remember going to the Kinema Ballroom, seeing The Selector, Elvis Costello, Madness. And, um, you know, people used to come to Dunfermline. Big, you know, people that we regard as big names now from all over the UK used to come to Dunfermline because they knew there was a, to use the Paul McStay phrase, there was a buzz about the place. And um, the Kinema Ballroom, I remember late 70s, early 80s. I didn't go as much as I should have gone. But I can remember seeing some fairly big chart acts mm -hmm. as they became in the Kinema Ballroom. And, um, and of course, that's where Nazareth started. They started as a, 
uh, like a rock rock and roll band called the Red Hawks, and then they moved on to become Nazareth. And uh, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, Paul, just an incredible, for a fairly small town, an incredible music scene, you know, almost like the Manchester of Scotland, if you like. It's great, and it's great that currently I think we've got a really good venue in PJ Malloy's, which is just a small pub in Dunfermline. They're doing some great things with live music. I mean, I've I seen Jake Bug there the week that Jake Bug went to number one with his debut album. And it was uh, something they had booked in the calendar months in advance. And obviously the boy had exploded, but he kept his uh, book in there and he, he came and played at PJ Malloy's. And, you know, the, the eight pound ticket, you could have probably sold it for a hundred quid at that point, Alex. So to use that Paul McStay phrase, I think you're right. Getting a buzz about the place is, is just something that brings back memories in the 1980s. And I'm going to ask you a question about the 80s because obviously you've been a, an observer and a commentator on Scottish football. It's a, it's a thing that's come up. It's a subject that's come up a few times on a podcast about this Scottish football revolution of 1986 and Graham Souness coming back from Sampdoria and joining Rangers as a player manager. And it is referred to as a revolution at that time. But I think when you look at the, the proud kind of European history of Scottish clubs, not just Celtic, who had a brilliant uh, record in the 60s and 70s, but right into the 80s with Aberdeen and Dundee United. You know, after 1986, Alex, that really dried up. And uh, even our, you know, World Cup record qualifying for the World Cup finals, every four years we were there, you know, growing up, you, you almost took it for granted. But we look at it now, we've never achieved that since 1998. And... My argument is, again, that it wasn't a revolution. It's just that when Souness came in, Rangers were the first club to go into debt, and then others followed. Celtic followed almost to their detriment, and other clubs followed as well. Then there was the influx of overseas players that, up to that point, it was really few and far between, particularly at Celtic. We had very few uh, overseas players at that point. Do you agree with the idea that, that Souness was a revolution, or do you think Scottish football changed, but long-term, for the worse? I would say that Souness turned the Scottish football into... I think Souness made the rest of the UK take an interest in Scottish football. I think before 1986, as far as I can remember, you know, there was kind of pockets where Scottish football would be featured on a, on a UK level. But I think Souness coming to Rangers suddenly... Um, well, you know, they refer to Rangers as the quintessential British club. But I think, I think when Souness came to Rangers, I think it was the first time the whole of Britain really took notice of Rangers and Scottish football. And I think a lot of people in England and in Wales and in, you know, and in, even in Ireland suddenly realised how big this Celtic Rangers thing was. I think we, we obviously we always knew how big it was, but I think soon as coming to Rangers was the time when maybe London started to look up here. And, um, you know, you wonder, you know, if soon as hadn't been at Rangers, you know, you wonder if, you know, would the Sky deals have still happened? You know, I mean, I know Sky didn't come on until about four years after soon as joined Rangers, but would all that have happened? I, wonder, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to say, but certainly both Celtic and Rangers were spending like, you know, they were, they were spending like English teams. Back then. I've studied the Celtic response to that in great depth, obviously, because it was the beginnings, really, of uh, you know the, the false economy of throwing money at players and bringing them up from down south. And it didn't work out for Celtic because the players simply did not perform, Alex. And then a few years later, were, you know, were facing financial ruin. At that time, when Fergus McCann came in and saved Celtic, which he absolutely, without a doubt, did, where were you in terms of Scottish football? Had you moved into the media side of things by then? Yeah, I was kind of making a bid for a full-time media job. I was writing for a, an English football magazine at the time called Football Today. And actually, my co-Scottish writer was Jim Craig. Right. And um, we used to do about four or five pages on Scottish football right in the middle of this magazine that was um, um, actually made and printed and published in the, in the West Midlands. And uh, 86, 87, 88, I was pretty prolific at that time. I was doing football writing as a second job. I was writing for Scottish Football Today. I was writing for Football Today. I was writing for The Punter when it came around. I was writing fanzine stuff as well. I had almost like this other persona as a fanzine writer. I wrote for The Absolute Game. I wrote for When Saturday Comes. So I was in a funny position at the time because one minute I'd be writing a very kind of straight, almost tabloid, mainstream article for a Football Today or a Scottish Football Today. And then the next night, I would maybe get my fanzine head on 
and I'd go and write a, a piece about cow and beef for the absolute game or the Scotland national team for when Saturday comes. And um, it was, uh, yeah, late 80s, 86, 87, 88, 89 was when basically I was um, doing a lot of football writing as a freelance. And that led in a funny sort of way to me getting into broadcasting in uh, 1990. So we had four years at the end of the 80s where it was a lot of writing. And then finally, I got into what I really wanted to get into, which was uh, which was radio. I had always done, you know, hospital radio on and off. And, you know, if podcasts had existed at that time, I would have been on a lot of podcasts as well, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, you mentioned the fan scene culture. It's something, again, that on a Celtic state of mind, we do talk about quite a bit. I was entrenched in the, the late 80s Celtic fanzines. And I think that was because there was really a cause at that time to to have a fanzine and to have a voice that was separate from the official vehicle which was the Celtic View at that time. So I immersed myself in things like Not The View and latterly in, in Once A Tim, Always A Tim as well, but Not The View, which to this day still produces a monthly fanzine, is, is quite incredible. When you were writing for fanzines, Alex, was it under a pseudonym or did it all come under Alex Horsprey? Yeah, I, I, I just wrote it under my own name. Because um, you know, I I um, I just kind of I kind of wanted to get my name out there because I thought you know if I, if I'm going to if I'm going to present a body of work to somebody whether it be a newspaper or a radio station or whatever I'm going to have to have my name on it so that was and luckily the the unusual nature of my surname kind of worked in my favour as well because it was memorable and uh, yeah I just I but one the reason the reason I wrote under my own name was because I thought well you know I, I enjoy writing it. I enjoy writing all this stuff, but I'm going to build up a body of work here. And I used to put a lot of this stuff in, you know, binders and stuff. And, and I always thought if I ever, if, if somebody from full-time media ever wants to, to give me an interview, then bang, I can put that on the desk. And there it is. Not only can I do fanzines, I can do mainstream. Uh, and I had all my old hospital radio tapes as well. So I had shows on cassettes and stuff. So I was trying to build up a body of work, but, uh, the fanzines were great. The fa- I, I guess the fanzines, in a funny sort of way, and you'll be able to relate to this, Paul, in a funny sort of way, the, the mainstream stuff for football today and Scottish football today, that was you like, that was almost like you being a, you know, a, com- a, a, a holiday camp comedian. And then when you went to fanzines, you were allowed to be an alternative comedian, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. Um, and, and I enjoyed both disciplines because I did see them as disciplines. And it gave me... Um, it gave me an insight into how people think as well. And, um, and you know, I'm one of these people uh, who I've got quite kind of wide taste in things. Um, I don't usually judge a song by the band. If I like the song, I like the song. Mm-hmm. And I'm not ashamed to say it. You know, if I like an ABBA song, I'll say I like that ABBA song. But if I like a Bon Jovi song or a, you know, or a, or a Rammstein song, I'll say, well, I like that as well. And um, I think that's one thing I've, I've, I've had in my favour. You know, I can, I'm not a keyhole person. I like to see bigger pictures, if you know what I mean, Paul. We mentioned my theories on 1980s football in Scotland. Moving into the 1990s, Alex, where, again, the fanzine culture was still prevalent. It certainly was. The terrorist culture, a part of that was fanzines coming through. You've mentioned a couple of names there, actually, that I always look back fondly on Scottish football today. I love the fact that we had a magazine dedicated to Scottish football back then. And I don't know, actually, when that ceased publication, but I think it was before 2000. You might be able to correct me on that. I th- I just, kind of 1990s was its heyday, as far as I remember. Yeah, Scottish football, football today, the punter, they all kind of went by the wayside, 92, 93, I think. And it was just kind of moving into that kind of 93 period that um, the mainstream magazines kind of went their separate ways because it, it just it was just impossible to sustain them. But the fanzines continued. I mean, I still did stuff for the Absolute Game. I can remember doing articles for the Absolute Game for the 1998 World Cup. Mm-hmm. And I know Archie McGregor, who was a St. Johnson fan, um, Archie was very much the, uh, you know, the brains behind it. I think he continued into the early 2000s. It also produced people like uh, Christopher Brutmeyer, who is, uh, you know, a well-known writer now. Um, I think one of his, I mean, one of his books that I always remember is A Big Boy Did It and Ran Away and Chris Brookmeyer and I think Rab Christie who ended up becoming a scriptwriter on BBC Comedy right. um, these were all guys that featured alongside me in the credits on the Absolute Game and I'm sure there was others as well The other thing about the 1990s I had a very interesting interview with Jock Brown some time ago actually Alex it was probably a couple of years back but it was one of those situations and you've probably been in this situation yourself where I went home and listened back to the tape and the quality of the sound wasn't good enough to use it on the podcast so it's there 
for me to go back and actually type it up at, at some stage. And it was a very good interview. But one thing he said that always sticks with me is, obviously his brother was the manager of Scotland in the 98 World Cup finals, the last time we reached the finals uh, of any tournament. And he said that what Craig Brown wanted was for... The SFA to invest, they had this money, I think it was something like 54, 55 million pounds, they had this this money, a lot of that was through the lottery but also prize money and this kind of thing and Craig Brown wanted to invest it in grassroots football and his kind of theory was that you could get 51 million pound pitches and erect them all over Scotland, get them right into all the all the wee villages and, and uh, give the facilities back to these places that used to you know, produce excellent world-class footballers and obviously we pumped all the money into Hamden and offices and facilities and we never ever did that and it rang true when I was watching the World Cup finals and Jürgen Klinsmann was one of the the pundits Alex and they were watching this Japanese team absolutely taking everybody by surprise I think eventually they got beat by Belgium didn't they Japan and you know at half time they, they were beating Belgium I think 2 nothing. And then Belgium came back. You might be able to correct me on that. And one three two, I think. And you know, they say to Jurgen Klinsmann, and Klinsmann says, "Well, I'm not surprised because 20 years ago, the equivalent of the Minister of Sport in Japan realised that there was all these empty tennis pitches. So what he decided to do was turn them into to football pitches for all the different areas that kids could go and actually play. And because the facilities were there, they were used. And 20 years later, they're producing players that can play in the highest level of football. I mean, this is a debate that could go on and on and on. But, you know, from someone who's been watching the game for so long, Alex, why has our national sport deteriorated to such a degree that we just cannot compete at that level now? I think it's all in our heed, Paul. I always said, I, I said 1996 when uh, Gary McAllister missed that penalty at Wembley. I had a debate with somebody after that game, that England-Scotland game, and I said, we need a sports psychologist. We need somebody in there, almost like a motivational coach, to say to players, believe in yourselves. I mean, I wrote an article a couple of days ago for the Football History Boys, and it was, you know, it was kind of plotting five great, Scotland goals and, and, and goals that showed the kind of the, the Jekyll and Hyde nature of our national team. And um, I think we've always had the ability, Paul. I don't think the ability, I mean, I think in the last couple of years, okay, maybe the ability has dropped back a wee bit. But I would say until the mid 2000s, the late 2000s, you know, we had some, we still had some really good players. And um, I think with Scotland, it's a kind of psychological thing. I think it's almost like, um, I think we almost believe we put ourselves in the underdog position. Um, this kind of eternal underdog thing, this glorious defeat thing, um, it's really got into our DNA over the years. And um, there's something a bit perverse about the Scotland national team. They're, you know, I think they started to enjoy that glorious losers thing a wee bit too much. And I couldn't believe that even, you know, no disrespect to the women that played in, in the Women's World Cup, but I couldn't believe that this kind of glorious defeat thing even bled into the women's game. Um, you know, that Argentina game, and when we were 3-0 up, and OK, it was a dodgy penalty uh, decision and all the rest of it, but to be 3-0 up and to draw 3-3, to answer your question, Paul, there's something in the Scottish psyche, and it's something you can maybe explore, and maybe you've explored it already, but there's something in our psyche that, that makes us blow up, and it's incredible that uh, we haven't yet qualified for the second stage of a major tournament, and it's incredible we've gone 22 years mm. without getting to a finals of any sort. I, I, I think the ability has been there in the past, and I think the ability will come back. I think we've still got nugget, nuggets like Andy Robertson. We we you know we gold uh, we diamonds if you like. Yeah. It's a, we need a I think we need a sports psychologist. I think we need somebody to tell us. I, I was always in favour of Brian Clough becoming the Scotland manager. I know this is going back a bit. But I was always in favour of Brian Clough or even Terry Venables becoming the Scotland manager because I think these managers would have told these players, "You guys are good enough." And I know Craig Brown would say that as well, but there's just something. There's a. I, th- I think we need almost. Uh, I think we need the psycho- the psychiatrist couch for the Scotland team sometime. Paul, that's interesting. And again, we're all very passionate about Scottish football, Alex. You know, and we're always up against it when you see some of the reports and the comments coming up from down south about our game, and we, we will protect it. You know, every, and it's the same for every. Every team, every you know set of supporters, they, they're very protective of the Scottish game. So we do want to see an upturn in, in our uh, national team's performances. Now, one thing that I do with Celtic supporters, Alex, is I do ask for the greatest Celtic eleven of their lifetime players that they have seen. But even though you're a Cowden Beath fan, you've seen enough football in your football supporting life to be able to assemble a team for me. 
and give me a greatest Celtic 11 if you are able. Could you do that for me just before we finish up? Well, I would have to put Ronnie Simpson in goals because not only because of the European Cup final, but because of the fact that he played in that 67 team at Wembley. I think he was 37 when Scotland became the first team to beat England, uh, the world champions. So Ronnie Simpson in goal. Danny McGain, of course, he's at number two, no doubt about it. I'd put Jim Craig at three just because I've known Jim over the years and Jim's a really good guy. And, um, you know, he's, he's he, you know, he is a gentleman in the true sense of the word. Paul McStay in the old right half position, if you like. Billy McNeil, of course, you can't leave Caesar out. I put John Clark in at six, again, not just because he was in that European Cup team, but he did a very good job as Cowden Beef manager, believe it or not, in, in, in the mid-80s. Jimmy Johnson, Jinky at seven, for obvious reasons. Dal Gleish at eight. Larson, it would have to be Larson up front. Here's one for you, Joe Craig at 10. I worked with Joe early in my broadcasting career and uh, Joe was a very good pundit. I, I don't know why Joe didn't progress as a pundit in the early 90s or into the or even into the, the 2000s. Joe was a very underrated striker at Celtic and of course he holds the, uh, the dubious honour of being the only Scotland player to come on as a sub, score with his first touch and never get picked again. And uh, that was in 1977 against Sweden. I think he scored the third goal in a 3-0 win. He came on as a sub. First time he touched the ball was a header that made it 3-0 and he was never picked again. And I could never, I could never understand why Joe Craig didn't play more for Scotland. I think he's a he's a very much an unsung uh, Celtic hero. At eleven, um, ooh, I don't know. I'll throw in a wild card. Um, I don't know if I ever wanted to play for Celtic, but I'll I'll stick Tommy Hutchison in at eleven. And the reason I'll stick Tommy Hutchison in at eleven was again I think he was a very underrated player. Missed a, missed a penalty against Spain in the 70s, which kind of wrecked his career with Scotland. But uh, my old man used to drink, my late father used to drink with Tommy Hutchison's father-in-law. And Tommy Hutchison used to get autographed Coventry and Manchester City programmes for me. He'd pass them on to his, uh, his father-in-law and um, and his father-in-law would pass them on to my dad, and my dad would pass them on to me. And for years and years before I sold my programme collection, one of the big regrets in my life, I had I had a lot of Coventry and Manchester City programmes and um, I always thought Tommy Hutchins was an underrated player. Aloha, Blackpool, Swansea, Man City, and uh, and Coventry. But I'll stick him in at eleven because I can't think of a I can't think of an eleven for Celtic. So there you are. There's a very unusual Celtic eleven for you, Paul. You're allowed a wild card because I, one of the questions I do ask is give us a player that you would have loved to have seen playing for Celtic. So we'll we'll give you that. We'll give you Tommy Hutchinson in the number eleven shorts, Alex. But uh, I'll tell you, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you tonight about Scottish football. And also about your memories of Celtic and uh, five bands of yesteryear. It's been an absolute pleasure, but let's do it again. And hopefully I can catch up with you after the lockdown's finished as well, Alex. Yeah, absolutely, Paul. It's been a pleasure. It's been really interesting and really good. Yeah, it's been enjoyable. Thanks a lot, Paul. 